I have another clarification. Or uh, last week when I talked about the resulting uh, Palestinian refugees in the uh, first Arab-Israeli uh, conflict, uh, I cited over over 700,000 refugees, but some of you heard 70 and some 700, and we're surprised. <laughs> uh, usually 70 refugees does not get many people's attention. Uh, in fact, there were, uh, in fact, closer to 750,000 who uh, fled the territories that now were now in raised by the new state of Israel. This shows the uh, UNSCOP plan <coughs> and then the resulting uh, Israeli state as a result of the 48-49 uh, conflict. Uh, so approximately 80% uh, of the Arab population who had lived in this territory uh, fled with half going to Jordan, um, about 200,000 to uh, Gaza, which now is controlled by Egypt but not absorbed, uh, 100,000 to Lebanon, 70,000 to Syria, and then uh, Iraq, some, some other countries. But in the other, except for Jordan, which now went from Transjordan to Jordan because it had the uh, the West Bank, and you can see Jordan, uh, they were not granted citizenship in those respective countries. And we'll get to that um, during the course of today's uh, presentation. And today I wish to focus on the end of European rule, Nasser again and his legacy, uh, and the creation of, pardon me? I'm sorry. Well, all right. But see, if it gets too close, then, but it doesn't seem, oh, it cut off. It wasn't me. Excuse the uh, Is this any better? Is it great? Uh, oh God. <laughs> uh, And included in this will be the rise of the Praetorian state, uh, Praetorian states, and resurgence of, of uh, Islamic movements in the area. All of this kind of cross-cut uh, with interstate rivalries. First, let's turn to uh, North Africa and the. Uh, Tunisia and Algeria becoming independent. Tunisia in 56, Algeria in 1962. But Algeria is the big issue. Um, as noted before, the Algerian Revolution started in 1954 and was the most enduring and hard-fought war of independence in the modern history of the Middle East. The French had viewed Algeria as part of metropolitan France, uh, with over 350,000 Europeans living in the country, but out of a total of about 9.5 million people. That was in the early 50. As you can see, the death toll was horrendous, with about a million people killed uh, during the seven-year uh, struggle. And this depicts both the, the Battle of Algiers and uh, 
the retaliation by, uh, by the French. And it was de Gaulle who came to power pretty much because of Algeria uh, that independence was granted in 1962, not without military resistance, I may add. Um, but in 1962, essentially, not only in Algeria, but uh, French possessions in Africa and Asia also became independent. So we see the eclipse of the uh, French Empire. But during this same period, 1960s, actually late 50s, 1960s, the Arab-Israeli conflict continued to fester with ongoing border incursions on both sides. Uh, the Israelis actually starting in 1952 under commando leader named Ariel Sharon. The Arabs aren't the only one to have the same faces <laughs> in uh, government for long periods of time, uh, although they moved around more. Um, this was accompanied by an arms race, for in the uh, wake of uh, the ill-fated attempt by the Europeans in Suez, the British and French in Suez, and the Israelis uh, in 1956, France became the chief arms patron of Israel, and the Soviet became the chief arms supplier of the Arab states, especially Egypt, Syria, and Iraq. Since 1949, many Arab leaders had called for a second round to secure an Arab pas uh, Palestine. In 1964, uh, Gamal Nasser uh, sponsored the establishment of the Palestine Liberation Organization uh, headquartered in Cairo. But he kept this on a pretty short leash uh, and ig ignored major figures within the Palestinian uh, movement. But in 1967, with increasing border uh, incidents involving Palestinian commandos and Israeli retaliation raids, most of uh, these emanating from Syria, uh, but of course you have a Syria that has a mutual defense pact with Egypt. In, in late May, um, but I should mention something about these border raids. One of the first papers I did, well, was part in graduate school. I, uh, after just after the Six Day War, I looked at uh, the border incursions and the tempo of Arab-Israeli relations. It, was there a particular border incursion that seemed to tip the scale? And the answer was no. They were ongoing, but it was very hard to discern what kind of violence might turn into war. Um, in late May, the Soviets informed Egypt that Israeli defense forces were massing on the border. Um, and with this, Nasser began to engage in his own kind of brinksmanship taking a page from John Foster Dulles, in that he demanded U.S. peacekeeping forces withdrawn from Gaza. They had been put in uh, <coughs> uh, since the 56 uh, Suez crisis, and denying Israel the use of the Gulf of uh, Aqaba, which is this right here and access to Elat uh, in, the, in the south. There's the Gulf of, of Aqaba. Um, calling this an act of war, on the 5th of June, Israel launched air attacks against Egyptian, devastating air attacks, uh, against Egyptian, Iraqi, Jordanian, and Syrian, Syrian military airfields and followed this up with ground attacks in the Golan Heights, the West Bank, Gaza, and 
Sinai. Within just six days, Israel was in possession now of all of these uh, territories, essentially uh, from the Gulf of, Gulf of Suez into the uh, Golan Heights. Uh, we're now in Israeli uh, hands, creating a kind of greater Israel. Now, this Israeli victory uh, was an even more stunning defeat than the Arabs had experienced in 1948 and became known as al-Nakfa, uh, or the defeat. Also, because of the intervention by the Soviets and the US, the Arab-Israeli conflict now became an integral part of the Cold War, which meant that to a great extent, what happened on the ground was not as important as each superpower viewing what the other superpower was doing. Um, and it was from that time you begin to have, why should we be concerned about the Arab-Israeli conflict, Peter Jennings and others, because it could start the cold, a hot war. Now, actually on its face, this is nonsense. <laughs> Neither the Israelis or the Arabs were actually capable at that time of major uh, conflagration. But of course, it could be, it would be more in the, in the sense that Sarajevo started World War I. So, um, but we were at the height of the uh, Cold War at that time. So it was viewed through big power advantage. But I'm, Tom will be dealing with this. But it did change a basic argument relative to the con conflict. As opposed to a second round and, uh, say, the elimination of Israel, there was now a call for land for peace, that is, regaining the territories lost for securing peace. And this call was actually led by uh, King Hussein of Jordan um, and made speaking tours in the United States uh, to do it. That picture of Nasser was deliberate by my friend. <laughs> Not a good result from their perspective. Now, actually, this argument did resonate to some extent because the world community as a whole never did and st still doesn't recognize the occupied territories as an integral part of Israel. They are still referred to as the uh, occupied territory, and several resolutions were passed to supposedly that we deal uh, with this uh, but today have not come to naught, have come to naught. On the other hand, many Israelis uh, did view this as, in, view many of these territories, especially the West Bank, to be an integral part of Israel. And you begin to have the issue of Israeli settlements. Now the person who bore the brunt of Arab bitterness was Gamal Nasser. <coughs> He was supposed to be the savior, and uh, it didn't turn out that way. But he still remained the principal Arab voice in the region until his death in 1970. Um, and with his death, millions weeped. This is a picture of Nasser's funeral. Now, this group right here are world leaders. <laughs> in the midst of it. And I remembered the funeral because a few years earlier, Churchill had died and remembered his funeral. And the outpouring in terms of Nasser was far greater than we saw for uh, Churchill, though they didn't have the Pipers, um, which was nice. So what is Nasser's legacy? First. All of North Africa and the Middle East was now, in, by his death, independent. With Egypt having 
uh, a major role in doing this. Uh, Radio Cairo was a very strong station. Uh, it was able to uh, uh, supplant European news sources, especially in places such as Algeria. The last of the British forces left the Gulf uh, in 1971. And with Gaddafi's rule in Libya, which we'll get to, American and British bases were closed down in uh, Libya. At Tripoli, uh, the American Air Force base at Tripoli uh, in the 1960s was the largest U.S. Air Force base in the world, and the British had bases in eastern Libya. But of course, you now found, found not a British, French, or actually even American, you found um, Soviet advisors in Egypt, Syria, and Iraq. But its brinksmanship, 1967, did vanquish Arab rule in any part of Palestine, uh, along with Egypt losing Sinai. The Suez Canal was closed, uh, still littered with uh, ships that had been sunk during the 67 war. And of course, this presented a bigger challenge for Europeans than for Americans um, in terms of <coughs> uh, length of time and shipping rates. And it was this time, uh, since 67, you've had the rise of the supertanker. Couldn't deal with the canal anyway. While Egyptian institutions seemed to work, that is, with the uh, Anwar Sadat, who was vice president, becoming president. Uh, and the lives of ordinary Egyptians improving since 1952, the economy under Nasser was to struggle, in many respects, in a shambles. With high unemployment and especially high underemployment uh, in the country, he had adopted the Soviet model uh, in which he created a command, uh, bureaucratic command economy uh, under which Egyptians uh, increasingly chafed. The economic problems were, ex these economic problems were exacerbated by the growing influx of rural uh, folks into the major cities. Uh, and I will return to that issue uh, next week. With the defeat in 1967, the Palestinians no longer looked to the Arab heads of state to secure their future and began to take on uh, the world, uh, launching a number of terrorist attacks uh, throughout Europe, parts of the Middle East. Um, and in Israel. And you have some of the principal uh, folks, this is of course Munich, but Yasser Arafat, whose actually chief support was from Fatah, which he was one of the uh, early uh, leaders and chairman of the, of the overarching Palestinian li uh, liberation organization. Uh, he was able to nudge Nasser's choice away. And then George Habash of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine that was centered in Syria, uh, and along with uh, Leela Khalid, who was poster woman for the terrorist attack, having been engaged in two uh, aircraft hijackings. And then um, one of the most famous was Abu Nadal, who was a founder, one of the founders of Fatah, but broke away because they said they were too passive. Um, Carlos the Jackal was associated with uh, Abu Nadal. Now, another legacy was that under Nasser we saw the rise of the secular Praetorian state. That is a state where most of the leaders came out of the military 
military gained a stronger, uh, uh, a stronger hand. And there was an increased quashing of dissent. So that one man authoritarian rule under both presidents and monarchs uh, became the norm. And they stayed. Uh, here you can see Nasser himself, who had been in power essentially, well, 18 years, but as Hal Jolson, Jolson said in one of the movies, you ain't seen anything yet. And so here we have major leaders in 1970. Um, Bourguiba of, of Tunisia, uh, King Hussein of Jordan, and of course newer, uh, and in one sense the grandfather was Shah, I'll include him, uh, Pahlavi in Iran, outside the area, but come important. Um, but of course, the grand case is that of uh, Jordan's King Hussein, who for all of the time he was in power, almost 50 years, generally was referred to in, by Middle East specialists on his tottering throne, uh, constantly under, uh, under pressure. Um, and I give him uh, great credit for, for being uh, uh, a survivor, kind of like George I. Melienko. Uh, now, of course, in the uh, 79 and 81, they were joined by two others we'll get to later, Saddam Hussein in Iraq and Hosni uh, Mubarak. Now, what I try to do, you can see, actually, the handsomest person here is, of course, Gaddafi, <laughs> the young captain who uh, overthrew King Idris in 1969. But of course, one of the major themes that we could see was uh, that in the absence of uh, military and economic success in the region, more Arabs began questioning the entrenchment of secular governments and mores. Now, in the beginning of the 1970s, except for some Gulf states, uh, and especially in, those, in urban areas, you have people uh, favoring Western fashions over traditional dress. Alcohol was sold openly, had been for some time. And men and women mixed more freely in public and private spaces. Uh, so that first picture you see of 1901 uh, of, of two women with uh, veil in Cairo. These are Cairo street scenes. Uh, my favorite is the 1978 one, well actually a number of favorites, uh, a group photo, very, you know, bell-bottom trousers and only one instance of any head covering at all. Very, very secular group that I've, you said where was this picture taken? It could be anywhere. Um, and if you ask Arabs what they wanted, they tended to say, we want to be like you. Um, and many people held on to that for a long time. But over time, this view was to be increasingly challenged. And if you look at Arab streets today, uh, you can see there's only one in the burqa, but uh, headscarves, but it's mixed. It's not a complete uh, uh, transformation. And as you can see in, you know, in two cases, this can be a fashion statement um, in terms of uh, modern fashion. I particularly noticed it had been back for a while, but in Istanbul, where it was rare to see a burqa in 1970. Uh, and now they were 
um, very much uh, in show. Now, as I mentioned, in 1970, uh, Nasser was replaced by Vas Vice President An Anwar Sadat, uh, who had some difficulty, of course, uh, in casting off uh, Nasser's uh, shadow. Uh, I was there in uh, 1971, uh, and you still had buildings festooned with Nasser's picture, pretty much like Chairman Mao in uh, China holds on. But in short order, Sadat began to dismantle the co command economy and usher in a more capitalist approach. Now, he also lived in a grander style. One of the reasons Nasser still holds, is held high in people's hearts, is that he had a very modest lifestyle. He was, he was rare. It's kind of the Mayor Daly syndrome. Um, they said, well, yeah, but he had a machine, but you know, he still lived in um, the house he was born in. He also dropped the name United Arab Republic and reestablished Egypt as the name of the country. Now, in 1973, uh, he expelled Soviet advisors. And the interesting thing is, they went, they left. <laughs> now, the economists mentioned at the time, of course, if you owe, uh, if you owe a man or a person, uh, $2,000, you're in their debt. If you owe that person several million dollars, they're in some sense in your debt. So if something happens to you, uh, they but they left, which kind of undermines some of the rhetoric of the Cold War. Um, but in uh, October, uh, he launched a successful attack, somewhat successful uh, attack, against uh, the Israelis who were entrenched behind the Bar Lev line on the other side or on the e eastern side of the Suez Canal. And Syria invaded the Golan Heights. Now, this war is known in the West as the Yom Kippur War, in the Arab world as the Ramadan War, having taken place during those uh, holidays, when, of course, war wouldn't break out. Um, and it was interesting that this lasted four times longer than the previous war. I remember, I'm a fan of Peter Jennings, Peter Jennings standing in Israel and said, the Israelis haven't attacked. You know, it's now. 10 days. <laughs> um, so it uh, caught people's uh, attention. Also, it was during this uh, war that the United States sent arms to Israel and the Soviets sent arms to the Egyptians and the Syrians. Now, the end was quite messy. You had Egyptian troops, well, not so much in the Golan Heights, where Israel was able to re-secure that. But in, along the canal, you have is Egyptian troops in Sinai, kind of going like this. Israeli troops in Egypt, on the west bank of the canal, near uh, Cairo. And so what do you do in that circumstance? You call in Henry the K. <laughs> uh, and uh, Henry Kissinger's famous shuttle diplomacy, which is another thing I will essentially leave to, uh, uh, to Tom. But in 1974, you do have Israel withdrawing from the East Bank of Suez, uh, allowing the uh, canal to be um, reopened. While only a limited success, Success, I'm sorry. Sadat was applauded for scoring really the first Arab victory against the Israelis uh, 
especially, and especially in Egypt because the canal is reopened. He is also hailed as a friendly Arab leader. <sighs> Arab leaders were not known for bantering with the U.S. press. And during this period, the Prime Minister of Israel was uh, uh, Golda Meir. She bantered. Uh, she was probably the most uh, the favorite uh, prime Israeli Prime Minister in the United States. But so did Sadat. He could banter with Barbara Walters. He could banter with Walter Cronkite. Uh, had this big laugh, had a pipe, and so people felt, no, oh, he's our, our kind of guy. Uh, didn't see that with Yasser Arafat. Um, but of course, I know there is the, how do you maintain a stubble? Um, either have a beard or think, but of course, with the uh, new Hollywood look, the stubble is is now in. So I guess Yasser Arafat became a fashion leader uh, ahead of his time in, in that sense. Um, now, this was not received well, and even though they achieved su success and kept uh, the Arabs at bay, this was not received well in, uh, in Israel. Uh, and that along with a perceived uh, elitism on the part of the ruling Labor Party that had been in power to, for, since 1952 uh, showed a movement to the right, uh, especially among the Israeli uh, Arabs, the Arab, the immigrants who had come from essentially the Arab world or Sephardic Jews is seen as this Ashkenazi Sephardic uh, split. So uh, with a number of coalition governments, etc., in 1978, you have uh, Menachem Begin, that old terrorist, uh, becoming uh, the Prime Minister of Israel. That same year, Sadat surprised the world by flying to Jerusalem and addressing the Knesset. Uh, and this led to a number of meetings uh, that were convened by uh, Jimmy Carter uh, and led to the Oslo, I'm sorry, the Camp David Accords of 1978. Uh, Again, I won't go into detail because this is viewed in many parts, except to say in the West as a breakthrough in the conflict because Egypt did sign a peace treaty with Israel, which pretty much undermined the uh, possibility of an all-out war between the Arabs and the Israelis. And Egypt was to regain the Sinai. This came about in 1982. At the same time, the U.S. promised it, Egypt and Israel similar foreign aid at essentially uh, $3 million each. Now, this may seem equal, but let's look at this. That translated to $750 for each Israeli and $75 for each Egyptian. Uh, this is still pretty much in place. The, the biggest share of our foreign aid budget. But now it equals $336 for each Israeli citizen and $22 for each uh, Egyptian. There were also provisions in the accord, but mainly secret provisions, but uh, or to move forward on uh, securing Palestinian rights. But these were essentially rebuffed by uh, Menachem Begin in succeeding the few governments and were not really pursued at the time by the Americans. Now, the Arab world was furious at the signing of a separate peace treaty with Israel. 
especially uh, since it did not uh, dramatically secure any movement in terms of uh, Palestinian rights. And essentially boycotted Egypt, kicking them out of the uh, Arab League, you know, the founders, and moving it to, uh, to Tunis. And it was at this stage that uh, the first major rebuff uh, of Egyptians in the Ar of Egyptians and Egypt in the Arab world, uh, for Egyptians have, through much of the last 200 years, if not more, and to the present day, view themselves as the center of the Arab world. So it's a major issue. Now another issue that came in out of this was the Arab oil embargo against the West, especially uh, the United States, 1973-74. The embargo, along with increased nationalization of oil, uh, the oil fields, caused oil prices to skyrocket. And the famous gas shortages in the United States, 55 miles an hour, no gas. But of course, a boon to Japan. <laughs> uh, this first year, the Honda Civic was out, and uh, Toyota and, at that time, Datsun uh, soared while uh, big American cars sent to the scrap heap. Now, this was under the aegis of OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, which to some ex to a great extent is centered in the Middle East and North Africa. And where this is important is that oil now became an important issue in terms of interstate relations, in America's viewing of the Middle East. We enter into oil politics. It also became a big issue within the region. For instance, in Saudi Arabia, their gross domestic product rose from $5 billion in 1970 to $46 billion in 1975 because of the price rises associated with this. In Iran, which was the first to drop the uh, boycott and had become America's principal Muslim ally in the region, uh, oil revenue soared from 2.5 billion in 1972-73 to 20 billion in 1975-76. So now in the West, and you get these cartoons, the Arabs are seen as rich, corpulent, and uh, living off of us. But in fact, the bulk of the Arabs didn't. Uh, even with some oil, Egypt, Syria, Algeria, Lebanon, Tunisia, Yemen, remained pretty poor. Um, now, the other thing we have to remember, because we talk about the Arabs, for the last almost 40 years, the United States has consistently been the second or third oil and natural gas producer in the world. Uh, and we, when we talk about dependency on foreign oil, to some extent, it's because how much bloody oil we use. Uh, this last year, for instance, we were just almost tied with Saudi Arabia as how much oil we produce. Um, so we forget our own domestic uh, um, production. Now, as I mentioned, discussing NASA's legacy. In the 70s, we begin to witness an Islamic resurgence. Actually, it begins sometime in the 60s, but uh, it was especially true in the 70s. And for this, again, we need to turn to Egypt. For the oldest Islamic party in the Middle East is the Muslim Brotherhood that were established was established or founded in 1928 by Hassan al-Banna. 
and their formation is based on fighting against Western influences and what they saw as the erosion of Islamic values uh, in Egypt and in the Arab world. He was soon joined by Zinab al-Ghazali, uh, who formed the Egyptian Muslim Ladies Society. Now, one of the things that you may have noticed when you do this that included a number of women, because people perceive women don't do anything in the Middle East. Well, in fact, they had uh, an interesting role in the 1919 um, revolution. Um, they have played an important role with the rise of the Mus um, Muslim Brotherhood, Brethren, an important role in terms of Palestinian um, uh, resistance. Um, and it, it is interesting the West has taken a long time to uh, figure out uh, the degree of women's involvement. The French were surprised in Syria in the 1920s, the number of women who were acted as couriers and uh, also as um, guerrillas. And uh, you see this during the Algerian revolt. So um, the point is the diversity among women in the region, which is mirrored in most societies. Um, Gloria Steinem and Phyllis Schlafly. Um, to give a more domestic example. Now, both parties were banned, first by the king in Farouk in 1948, then by Nasser in 1954. But it had been revitalized in the 1960s by Saeed Kut, uh, who had attended school in the United States and in the 50s. Uh, wrote a book saying how shocked he was about uh, American society. He was not taken in. He did not want to be like us. Um, for his efforts, he, along with Zinab al-Ghazali, uh, spent a long time in jail. Uh, and during their prison sentences, both under, uh, went extensive torture by security services. And one of the things we see mainly since the 19, uh, 1960s are the number of prison alumni uh, who begin to join forces to some extent because against the existing regime because they don't like the regime. So one of the themes here that we'll see is resistance to a regime is one thing, adopting something else is another, and sometimes when there's a vacuum, the other thing uh, comes into play. It's kind of like Nixon's resignation. When you, the following election, you have this democratic landslide. Were they all Democrats? Do they believe in the great society? No. Why? They don't like Nixon. <sighs> um, and uh, we've seen a number of elections in this country based on that. But the Muslim Brethren uh, actually had planned, that initiated by Albana and uh, also uh, uh, revitalized by Al Ghazili, uh, a 13-year plan to influence the population in the hope of enlisting at least 75% of the people before a more Islamic program is imposed. It has consistently actually been a plan of the ballot box. But there have been offshoots of the brethren uh, who have had a more um, dramatic impact uh, on events and did not uh, share the view of the ballot box. Now, we first see this occurring in Egypt in the early 70s with engineering students, probably the most perceived to be the most secular group, the university joining the brethren, um, both men and women. Um, 
some of that in Egypt was uh, opposition to the Soviets. Um, remember, I was in Egypt after the Soviets had left, and they said, oh, we didn't like the Soviets because they, they didn't buy anything, for one thing. <laughs> they were bad tippers. <laughs> uh, but that wasn't the student view. Um, and the party, of course, was again manned by Sadat. But it didn't uh, stem the tide of student attachment and the tide of other people's attachment, plus the fact that you have more people coming in from rural areas who have a higher level of religiosity. Um, The Muslim Brotherhood spread to Syria uh, when the Ba'athists uh, came to power in 1963. The Ba'athists had been formed in 1941. It was an extremely secular uh, group, right-wing socialist group. Um, and they were to gain control in Syria and Iraq. Now. Their parties did attract Sunni Muslims, Christians, and Shia, say, Alawites in uh, Syria. The Alawites comprised about 12% of the population uh, and were to provide much of the leadership of the Ba'athist party in Syria, including the al-Assad family. But then the first major Islamic insurgency isn't in Egypt and isn't in the core Middle East. It is in Iran, in Shia Iran, uh, with the Iranian Revolution of 1978-79. Now, this is a case of increased loathing for the Shah. Uh, he had a number of plants look good to the people outside, but did not look as good to the people inside um, the country. And had, to a great increasing extent, relied on military and outside influence. His throne was saved by the British and Americans in 1952 in the Mossadegh affair. Uh, and in the 1970s, the American military presence in Iran had grown significantly. And that creates problems. We'll see. Now, I won't go into much detail, uh, but opposition had grown from both without the country and inside the country. He had banned all political parties and actually got the Americans to agree that we wouldn't talk to any opposition party. This is bizarre. In September of 1978, thousands took to the streets uh, to pr protest the uh, austerity program that had been introduced in 1978, economic austerity program, and was met by a severe police uh, crackdown. Seems familiar. Uh, with the crackdown, the number of protests increased, didn't diminish. And as I said, these focused on the Shah. Uh, on the Shah. But soon, focused on the 76-year-old Ayatollah uh, Musabi Kamani, who was in exile in France. Now, the senior cleric, this. Persian Iranian history is different in that the senior clerics in Shia Iran had traditionally been viewed as a countervailing influence against the kings. They had a role in doing that. They were quashed by uh, Shah Pahlavi's father in the 1920s, but that view had not gone away. Uh, and while Khomeini was considered a reformer, but uh, argued for a much more stringent Islamic society, uh, this was 
he was still part of an institution in Iran and thus had uh, greater visibility. He'd been sneaking tapes into the country for 10 years uh, with uh, sermons. The revolts went on. The, in January of 1979, the military collapsed and the Shah left the country. In February of 1979, Khomeini returned to uh, um, Iran, I'm sorry, not Iraq, Iran, and formed a government of the Islamic Republic of Iran. And he was welcomed with massive crowds. Uh, more crowds welcomed him than they did Lenin in uh, during World War I. This was the first successful, in, in one sense, Islamic revolt. But it was a revolt in which Khomeini was able to gain the support of not only students who had become more Islamists, uh, but merchants. Um, and increasingly, the middle class that thought that uh, uh, the Shah had gone too far. But the last major revolt had been the Wahhabi revolt under the aegis of uh, Ibn Saud, but that was in the early part of the 19th century. The United States was jolted by the loose loss of a significant ally and the subsequent hostage crisis. Tom Koppel was elated because he got a television show. Uh, that's where his nightline started with dubbed the crisis. Um, there were other events in this period that signaled more uh, distaste with an Islamic caste uh, for incumbent regimes. In 1979, Islamist guerrillas attacked a military academy in Aleppo, Syria, uh, where two-thirds of the students were Alawite, and they killed 79 of the cadets. This was followed by an assassination attempt against Hafez Assad in 1980. The Syrian military carried out lethal reprisals, especially in the town of Hama. Uh, that resulted in between 20 and 30,000 uh, deaths. Uh, Assad's brother claimed that he had killed 30,000. So he may have been bragging. I don't know. Um, in October of 1981, at the a ceremony uh, recognizing the canal crisis, uh, Anwar Sadat is assassinated by a member of the Algama al Islamiyah, which was a militant offshoot of the Mo Muslim Brotherhood. When the assassin fired the fatal shot, he cried out, I have killed the Pharaoh. That's this kind of secular thing, and you, you hear it in today's uh, commentary. Now, while mourned in the West, Sadat's death uh, was actually welcomed by many Egyptians who saw him as living in splendor. Uh, he and his wife, his wife was not liked. She was liked here, but not liked there. Uh, but he was seen as more interested in charming Western leaders and allowing a uh, kind of capitalist elite to form than in helping the average Egyptian. Um, Unlike Nasser, few Arab leaders attended his funeral, and it was a much smaller affair. Now, he was succeeded by his vice president, Hosni Mubarak, who did not appoint a vice president. Uh, it became, that's called foreshadowing. Uh, <laughs> In the mid-80s, we see Muslim insurgency. This is outside of the area, but has an impact in <coughs> Afghanistan. The rise of the Afghan Arabs or the Mujahideen. This insurgency is supported by the United States, uh, mainly the CIA. Now, 
this is outside the region, but it did cause the Soviets to leave and in the other part created a cadre of Arab fighters who were not pleased when they were not welcomed with open arms when they returned. Uh, for they would continue to flan, fan the flames when they returned to the Arab world. So what we see is twofold. One is a growing entrenchment of, of opposition to entrenched leaders, and Islamists is tending to lead in many of these revolts. In the West, this is seen as the rise of fundamentalist Islam and Islamic terror. But let's look at this. In the 1970s, yes, there is a rise of fundamentalist Islam. This is a terrible term, though, because it doesn't necessarily mean anything, because it's also adopted for, fu uh, for fundamentalist Jewish groups in Israel, the rise of fundamentalism, and in the United States with fundamentalist Christianity. All of these groups were reacting against what they perceived as an increasingly secular society taking God out of schools, for instance. So this was actually part of a kind of worldwide phenomena uh, that we can uh, lose sight, sight of. And with the fall of the Soviet Union, you have a problem in this country, I would posit. And that is, we need a boogeyman. <laughs> and the Soviets went away, jobs are in up for grabs, uh, as the British would say, redundancy notices were being put out. <laughs> How would you like to be declared redundant <laughs> as opposed to being laid off? Um, but, so it was part of a worldwide phenomenon. Now, this trend of also supporting those who hate those we hate. Uh, continued when uh, Iraq, in seeing an opportunity, Iraq invaded Iran for actually the first Persian Gulf War in 1981. Uh, this was viewed as a fight, because Saddam Hussein was a secularist, against Islamic fundamentalism uh, and against terrorism. And we supported uh, Iraq. In 1982, you have Israel invading Lebanon. Uh, I mention this because it also is the first war in Israel's history where you have a number of soldiers, it wasn't overwhelming, but uh, you have a number of soldiers refusing to fight, to join the fight. Uh, and this was not viewed with great favor around the world, but did result in the Palestinians' leadership being pushed to Tunis and was soon followed by the first intifada in the West Bank and Gaza in 1987. Oop, there's a person. Oop. Oh, that's right. And this was a case perceived because it was covered by the news of uh, stone-throwing stone children against uh, tanks. Um, and this was really the first time that you have Americans starting to say, um, the Arabs may have a point. But the big issue for us, and uh, which was to cause tremendous repercussions in the area, was the Persian Gulf War uh, of 1990-91. This is actually in the wake of a collapsing Soviet Union. Um, Saddam clearly misjudged the reaction of the West. But this is one of the few cases since World War II that you have a country actually invading, although the Israeli invasion of Lebanon could be that, invading another country without the pretext of being invited in by some group, 
uh, or being attacked by the country they're invading. So this was seen by many people in the world as a really blatant case of aggression. Both Prime Minister Thatcher and George uh, H. Bush, H. W. Bush, I'm sorry, condemned the attack and proclaimed the occupation will not stand. This is where it's interesting. In the wake of this attack, uh, with the urging of President Mubarak of Egypt, the Arab League votes 14 to 7, condemning the, the attack. Uh, although the Palestinians and uh, Libya sided with Iraq, uh, Jordan uh, remained neutral. Out of this, you have a broad military coalition that was led by the United States and Britain but included Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Syria, Qatar, Morocco, and Tunisia. Strange bedfellows uh, and surprised the world uh, that would counterattack 1991 under the rubric of Desert Storm. Now, I'm going over just a bit, but I want to name five issues that stand out. Saddam Hussein called for a jihad. Uh, no one believed him. The secular, the first time he had really invoked Islamic thing. But he also called for the liberation of Palestine, which Palestinians reacted positively to. The major military staging point was Saudi Arabia, which had not hosted any foreign military since the early 60s with the closing of the U.S. base at Dahran. And after the war, some forces continued to stay, which became a contentious issue. Israel, the principal at that time, the principal U.S. ally in the region, was left forced, they would say, on the sidelines, which really, to some extent, called in to question the value of the alliance. While George Bush uh, Sr., and Secretary of State Baker initially resisted. Uh, they both accepted the call by Arabs that something had to be done about the Palestinian issue. And last, the shock and awe of the air campaign in the fall of 1990 and the quick victory on the ground would startle the world. Thanks to CNN, this was the first war we actually viewed from both sides. Um, because there were CNN reporters in Baghdad, if you remember, uh, saw the effects of this campaign. We have the dramatic footage of bombing campaigns that prompted many, including myself, to refer to it as the Atari War. Oh, the students who were teenagers at the time just, oh, did you see that bomb? So it almost looked like a video game, uh, both the bombing war and then the very three-day attack. I would say, in my view, one of my students asked, do you think that the Persian War made the Arabs more afraid of the United States? And I said, I think the real problem of this war is it made Americans think war in the Middle East is a piece of cake. I think we became extremely overconfident, which I will extend next time. Taking seriously the Egyptian uh, or the problem the British had in Iraq, the United States or the coalition did not go to Baghdad or overthrow Saddam Hussein. But President Bush, for one, said, well, he'll be out of power in six months anyway. Uh, when there was an attempt to do that, we didn't support it. Now, I'm going to leave it there except for this. Uh, other issues, and I'll look at the Arab Israel, the uh, Oslo Accord. But by the end of the century, who do we have in power in the Middle East? Now, you may not recognize them because they've grown older. <laughs> Sometimes harder to get these age related pictures. Uh, and of course, Gaddafi had the hardest time aging. Um, but they're all the same. Now, this is 1999. By 
uh, 2000, there'd be changes. But what kind of changes? Oh, uh, King Hussein is succeeded by his son. Um, King Hassan is succeeded by his son. And Hafez al Said is succeeded by his son. So they may not, may, but they all died in office. I really wanted to t t title this, What a Great Job. <laughs> I think I'll stay. Uh, they, they do seem to have enjoyed it. So. And so next week we'll look at of Oslo, very short, but also get to uh, the 21st century and the Arab Spring. Any questions? Right. Kermit. Uh, uh, right. Mossadegh. Right. Mossadegh. Prime Minister Mossadegh. Who's a strange fellow. Like to walk. Oh, I'm sorry. He was talking about Iran and Roosevelt. The CIA involvement in. Uh, It, 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 it got rid of a legitimately uh, elected uh, it did. president for the future. <coughs> so therefore, for some reason, he felt that was important to us. Well, it's two things. It also shows it's a British. The British had tried to deal with Mossadegh earlier because of nationalization. This is in Iran in 1952. The uh, nationalization of oil. Americans equated nationalizing industry the same as a communist takeover. <laughs> uh, we, uh, we had the same issue in Latin America and other places. But what this also shows is the transition of British influence in the region to American influence. And I would posit that the American script in the Middle East was actually taken from the British. For instance, when we took over, we continued, but we increased because we're richer and we like big salaries, uh, the subsidies to King Hussein. The British had paid subsidies uh, up in there. So there wasn't necessarily a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of difference. This was at the time when the CIA was involved in many areas in the country, though Truman did resist getting rid of Mossadegh. As I said, an interesting guy. He'd wear pajamas a lot. Uh, but he was elected prime minister. Yes, sir. This great chain of um, men coming to power. The most prominent group in that chain seemed to me to be military and over jeeps, not that streets and uh, the military coming to power in the right. Ayatollah. Oh, well, yes, because the military collapsed. But these are guards, and the jeep they are in this one. You have people who resisted. Well, it was essentially the high command of the military collapsed, and you have soldiers going over to the, the uh, revolution. But soon, the guard that was formed adopted military um, gear, including this hat that we used to use in the early 1960s, but a number of other countries, including Fidel Castro, seemed to like to continue. The kind I wore. <coughs> and fatigues. Any other questions? Any? Any comments? Yes, in the back. 
Is that when we date American involvement with the? Well, with the turn of kind of this America and the U.S. take in the Middle East, because we yes. Yes, we supported the, uh, uh, the Shah, especially when he broke with the oil boycott and provided uh, more oil, which he made a fortune on. But I mean, he increased the price. But he was the first in the region to break the oil boycott. And the United States. Uh, number of people in the area increased. And I think that also contributed to the revolution, especially in Tehran. I was stationed in Ethiopia in the 1960s. We had a base in Eritrea. And there were 1,800 people, if you include dependents. A base you could take 20 minutes to walk around. Um, well, when satellites came, it became a satellite tracking station. And by the late 60s, this had grown to over 6,000 Americans. And I think it had an impact in terms of the revolution in uh, Ethiopia, not only the Eritrean one, but in Ethiopia itself uh, against Haile Selassie. You can support people too much. And, and what, why do I say that? These bases are enclaves. We saw the 99 days in Peking. They're enclaves, and these are American. I made more than an Ethiopian colonel as an E5. Uh, corporals could afford cooks and maids when they had dependents. And, uh, so sometimes it, it's similar to the Soviets in Egypt. You can overplay your hand, I think. But yes, we became much more involved, and he, they, they became our principal Muslim ally in the region. Um, and he loved it. I mean, the Shah seemed to like it. Um, and so did his wife. Anything else? Well? Hope to see you next week.